Chapter Thirty Six of the Life and Adventures of Martin Chuzzlewit by Charles Dickens. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Tom Pinch departs to seek his fortune. What he finds at starting. Oh, what a different town Salisbury was in Tom Pinch's eyes, to be sure, when the substantial pecksniff of his heart melted away into an idle dream. He possessed the same faith in the wonderful shops the same intensified appreciation of the mystery and wickedness of the place made the same exalted estimate of its wealth population and resources and yet it was not like the old city nor anything like it he walked into the market while they were getting breakfast ready for him at the inn and though it was the same market as of old crowded by the same buyers and sellers brisk with the same business noisy with the same confusion of tongues and cluttering of fowls in coops fair with the same display of rolls of butter newly made set forth in linen cloths of dazzling whiteness green with the same fresh snow of dewy vegetables dainty with the same array on higgler's baskets of small shaving glasses laces braces trouser straps and hardware savoury with the same unstinted show of delicate pig's feet and pies made precious by the pork that had once walked upon them still it was strangely changed to tom for in the centre of the market-place he missed a statue he had set up there as in all other places of his personal resort and it looked cold and bare without that ornament the change lay no deeper than this for tom was far from being sage enough to know that having been disappointed in one man it would have been a strictly rational and eminently wise proceeding to have revenged himself upon mankind in general by mistrusting them one and all indeed this piece of justice although it is upheld by the authority of diverse profound poets and honourable men bears a near resemblance to the justice of that good vizier in the thousand and one nights who issues orders for the destruction of all the porters in baghdad because one of that unfortunate fraternity is supposed to have misconducted himself than to any logical not say christian system of conduct known to the world in later times tom had so long been used to steep the pecksniff of his fancy in his tea and spread him out upon his toast and take him as relish with his beer that he made but a poor breakfast on the first morning after his expulsion nor did he much improve his appetite for dinner by seriously considering his own affairs and taking counsel thereon with his friend the organist's assistant the organist assistant gave it as his decided opinion that whatever tom did he must go to london for there was no place like it which may be true in the main though hardly perhaps in itself a sufficient reason for tom's going there but tom had thought of london before and had coupled with it the thoughts of his sister and of his old friend john westlock whose advice he naturally felt disposed to seek in this important crisis of his fortunes to london therefore he resolved to go and he went away to the coach office at once to secure his place the coach being already full he was obliged to postpone his departure until the next night but even this circumstance had its bright side as well as its dark one for though it threatened to reduce his poor purse with unexpected country charges it afforded him an opportunity of writing to mrs lupin and appointing his box to be brought to the old finger-post at the old time which would enable him to take that treasure with him to the metropolis and save the expense of its carriage so said tom comforting himself it's very nearly as broad as it's long and it cannot be denied that when he had made up his mind to even this extent he felt an unaccustomed sense of freedom a vague and indistinct impression of holiday-making which was very luxurious he had his moments of depression and anxiety and they were with good reason pretty numerous but still it was wonderfully pleasant to reflect that he was his own master and could plan and scheme for himself it was startling thrilling vastly difficult to understand it was a stupendous truth teeming with responsibility and self-distrust but in spite of all his cares it gave a curious relish to the viands at the inn and interposed a dreamy haze between him and his prospects in which they sometimes showed to magical advantage in this unsettled state of mind tom went once more to bed in the low four-poster to the same immovable surprise of the effigies of the former landlord and the fat ox and in this condition 
passed the whole of the succeeding day when the coach came round at last with london blazoned in letters of gold upon the boot it gave tom such a turn that he was half disposed to run away but he didn't do it for he took his seat upon the box instead and looking down upon the four greys felt as if he were another grey himself or at all events a part of the turnout and was quite confused by the novelty and splendour of his situation and really it might have confused a less modest man than tom to find himself sitting next to that coachman for all of the swells had ever flourished a whip professionally he might have been elected emperor he didn't handle his gloves like another man but put them on even when he was standing on the pavement quite detached from the coach as if the four greys were somehow or other at the ends of his fingers it was the same with his hat he did things with his hat which nothing but an unlimited knowledge of horses and the wildest freedom of the road could ever have made him perfect in valuable little parcels were brought to him with particular instructions and he pitched them into his hat and stuck it on again as if the laws of gravity did not admit of such an event as it being knocked off or blown off and nothing like an accident could befall it the guard too seventy breezy miles a day were written in his very whiskers his manners were a canter his conversation a round trot he was a fast coach upon a downhill turnpike road he was all pace a wagon couldn't have moved slowly with that guard and his key bugle on the top of it these were all foreshadowings of london tom thought as he sat upon the box and looked about him such a coachman and such a guard could never have existed between salisbury and any other place the coach was none of your steady-going yokel coaches but a swaggering rakish dissipated london coach up all night and lying by all day and leading a devil of a life it cared no more for salisbury than if it had been a hamlet it rattled noisily through the best streets defied the cathedral took the worst corners sharpest and went cutting in everywhere making everything get out of its way and spun along the open country road blowing a lively defiance out of its key bugle as its last glad parting legacy it was a charming evening mild and bright and even with the weight upon his mind which arose out of the immensity and uncertainty of london tom could not resist the captivating sense of rapid motion through the pleasant air the four greys skimmed along as if they liked it quite as well as tom did the bugle was in as high spirits as the greys the coachman chimed in sometimes with his voice the wheels hummed cheerfully in unison the brasswork on the harness was an orchestra of little bells and thus as they went clinking jingling rattling smoothly on the whole concern from the buckles of the leaders coupling reins to the handle of the hind boot was one great instrument of music yo ho past hedges gates and trees past cottages and barns and people going home from work yo ho past donkey chases drawn aside into the ditch and empty carts with rampant horses whipped up at a bound on the little watercourse and held by struggling carters close to the five-barred gate until the coach had passed the narrow turning in the road yo ho by churches dropped down by themselves in quiet nooks with rustic burial grounds about them where the graves are green and daisies sleep for it is evening on the bosoms of the dead yo ho past streams in which the cattle cool their feet and where the rushes grow past paddock fences farms and rickyards past last year's stacks cut slice by slice away and showing in the waning light like ruined gables old and brown yo ho down the pebbly dip through the merry water splash and up at a canter to the level road again yo ho yo ho was the box there when they came up to the old finger post the box was mrs lupin herself had she turned out magnificently as a hostess should in her own chaise cart and she was sitting in a mahogany chair driving her own horse dragon who ought to have been called dumpling and looking lovely did the stage-coach pull up beside her shaving her very wheel and even while the guard helped her man up with the trunk did he send the glad echoes of his bugle careering down the chimneys of the distant pecksniff as if the coach expressed his exultation in the rescue of tom pinch this is kind indeed said tom bending down to shake hands with her i didn't mean to give you this trouble trouble mr pinch cried the hostess of the dragon well it's a pleasure to you i know said tom squeezing her hand heartily is there any news the hostess shook her head say you saw me said tom and that i was very bold and cheerful and not a bit downhearted 
and that I entreated her to be the same, for all is certain to come right at last. Good-bye. You'll write when you get settled, Mr. Pinch, said Mrs. Lupin. When I get settled, cried Tom, with an involuntary opening of his eyes. Oh, yes, I'll write when I get settled. Perhaps I'd better write before, because I might find that it takes a little time to settle myself, not having too much money, and only having one friend. I should give your love to the friend, by the way. You were always great with Mr. Westlock, you know. Good-bye. Good-bye, said Mrs. Lupin, hastily producing a basket with a long bottle sticking out of it. Take this. Good-bye. Do you want me to carry it to London for you? cried Tom. She was already turning the chase cart round. No, no, said Mrs. Lupin. It's only a little something for refreshment on the road. Sit fast, Jack. Drive on, sir. All right. Good-bye. She was a quarter of a mile off before Tom collected himself. Then he was waving his hand lustily, and so was she. And that's the last of the old finger-post, thought Tom, straining his eyes, where I have so often stood to see this very coach go by, and where I have parted with so many companions. I used to compare this coach to some great monster that appeared at certain times to bear my friends away into the world, and now it's bearing me away to seek my fortune, heaven knows where and how. It made Tom melancholy to picture himself walking up the lane and back to Pecksniff's as of old, and being melancholy he looked downwards at the basket on his knee, which he had for the moment forgotten. She is the kindest and most considerate creature in the world, thought Tom. Now I know that she particularly told that man of hers not to look at me, on purpose, to prevent my throwing him a shilling. I had it all ready for him all the time, and he never once looked towards me whereas that man naturally, for I knew him very well, could have done nothing but grin and stare. Upon my word, the kindness of people perfectly melts me. Here he caught the coachman's eye. The coachman winked. Remarkable fine woman for her time of life, said the coachman. I quite agree with you, returned Tom. So she is. Finer than many a young un, I mean to say, observed the coachman, eh? Than many a young one, Tom assented. I don't care for em myself when they're too young, remarked the coachman. This was a matter of taste which Tom did not feel himself called upon to discuss. You'll seldom find them possessing the correct opinions about refreshment, for instance, when they're too young, you know, said the coachman. A woman must have arrived at maturity before her mind's equal to coming provided with a basket like that. Perhaps you would like to know what it contains, said Tom, smiling. As the coachman only laughed, and as Tom was curious himself, he unpacked it and put the articles one by one upon the footboard. A cold roast fowl, a packet of ham in slices, a crusty loaf, a piece of cheese, a paper of biscuits, half a dozen apples, a knife, some butter, a screw of salt, and a bottle of old sherry. There was a letter besides which Tom put in his pocket. The coachman was so earnest in his approval of Mrs. Lupin's provident habits, and congratulated Tom so warmly on his good fortune, that Tom felt it necessary for the lady's sake to explain that the basket was a strictly platonic basket and had merely been presented to him in the way of friendship. When he had made the statement with perfect gravity, for he felt it incumbent upon him to disabuse the mind of this lax rover of any incorrect impressions on the subject, he signified that he would be happy to share the gifts with him, and proposed that they should attack the basket in a spirit of good fellowship at any time in the course of the night which the coachman's experience and knowledge of the road might suggest as being best adapted to the purpose. From this time they chatted so pleasantly together, and although Tom knew infinitely more of unicorns than horses, the coachman informed his friend the guard at the end of the next stage that rum as the box-seat looked, he was as good a one to go in point of conversation as ever he'd wished to sit by. Yo-ho among the gathering shades, making of no account the deep reflections of the trees, but scampering on through light and darkness all the same, as if the light of London fifty miles away were quite enough to travel by and some to spare yo ho beside the village green where cricket players linger yet and every little indentation made in the fresh grass by bat or wicket ball or player's foot sheds out its perfume on the night away with four fresh horses from the bald-faced stag where topers congregate about the door admiring and the last team with the traces hanging loose go roaming off towards the pond until observed and shouted after by a dozen throats, while volunteering boys pursued them, now with a clattering of hoofs, and striking out of fiery sparks across the old stone bridge, and down again into the shadowy road, and through the open gate, and far away, away into the world, yo-ho! 
yo ho behind there stop that bugle for a moment come creeping over to the front along the coach roof guard and make one at this basket not that we slacken in our pace the while not we we'd rather put the bits of blood upon their metal for the greater glory of the snack ah it's long since this bottle of old wine was brought into contact with the mellow breath of night you may depend and rare good stuff it is to wet the bugler's whistle with only try it don't be afraid of turning up your finger bill another pull now take your breath and try the bugle bill there's music there's a tone over the hills and far away indeed yo ho the skittish mare is all alive to-night yo ho yo ho see the bright moon high up before we know it making the earth reflect the objects on its breast like water hedges trees low cottages church steeples blighted stumps and flourishing young slips have all grown vain upon the sudden and mean to contemplate their own fair images till morning the poplars yonder rustle that their quivering leaves may see themselves upon the ground not so the oak trembling does not become him and he watches himself in his stout old burly steadfastness without the motion of a twig the moss-grown gate ill poised upon its creaking hinges crippled and decayed swings to and fro before its glass like some fantastic dowager while our own ghostly likeness travels on yo ho yo ho through ditch and brake upon the ploughed land and the smooth along the steep hillside and steeper wall as if it were a phantom hunter clouds too and a mist upon the hollow not a dull fog that hides it but a light airy gauze like mist which in our eyes of modest admiration gives a new charm to the beauties it is spread before as real gauze has done ere now and would again so please you though we were the pope yo ho now we travel like the moon herself hiding this minute in a grove of trees next minute in a patch of vapour emerging now upon our broad clear course withdrawing now but always dashing on our journey is a counterpart of hers yo ho a match against the moon the beauty of the night is hardly felt when day comes rushing up yo ho two stages and the country roads are almost changed to a continuous street yo ho past market gardens rows of houses villas crescents terraces and squares past wagons coaches carts past early workmen late stragglers drunken men and sober carriers of loads past brick and mortar in its every shape and in among the rattling pavements where a jaunty seat upon a coach is not so easy to preserve yo ho down countless turnings and through countless mazy ways until an old inn-yard is gained and tom pinch getting down quite stunned and giddy is in london five minutes before time too said the driver as he received his fee off tom upon my word said tom i should not have minded very much if we had been five hours after it for at this early hour i don't know where to go or what to do with myself don't they expect you then inquired the driver who said tom why them returned the driver his mind was so clearly running on the assumption of tom's having come to town to see an extensive circle of anxious relations and friends that it would have been pretty hard work to undeceive him tom did not try he cheerfully evaded the subject and going into the inn fell fast asleep before a fire in one of the public rooms opening from the yard when he awoke the people in the house were all astir so he washed and dressed himself to his great refreshment after the journey and it being by that time eight o'clock went forth at once to see his old friend john john westlock lived in furnival's inn high holborn which was within quarter of an hour's walk of tom's starting point but seemed a long way off by reason of his going two or three miles out of the straight road to make a short cut when at last he arrived outside john's door two stories up he stood faltering with his hand upon the knocker and trembled from head to foot for he was rendered very nervous by the thought of having to relate what had fallen out between himself and pecksniff and he had a misgiving that john would exult fearfully in the disclosure but it must be made thought tom sooner or later i had better get it over rat tat i am afraid that's not a london knock thought tom it didn't sound bold perhaps that's the reason why nobody answers the door it is quite certain that nobody came and that tom stood looking at the knocker wondering whereabouts in the neighbourhood a certain gentleman resided who was roaring out to somebody come in with all his might oh bless my soul thought tom at last perhaps he lives here and is calling to me i never thought of that 
Can I open the door from the outside, I wonder? Yes, to be sure I can. To be sure he could. By turning the handle, and to be sure when he did turn it, the same voice came rushing out, crying, Why don't you come in? Come in, do you hear? What are you standing there for, quite violently? Tom stepped from the little passage into the room from which these sounds proceeded, and had barely caught a glimpse of a gentleman in a dressing-gown and slippers, with his boots beside him ready to put on, sitting at his breakfast with a newspaper in his hand, when the said gentleman, at the imminent hazard of oversetting his tea-table, made a plunge at Tom and hugged him. "'Why, Tom, my boy,' cried the gentleman, "'Tom! How glad I am to see you, Mr. Westlock,' said Tom Pinch, shaking both his hands, and trembling more than ever. "'How kind you are!' "'Mr. Westlock?' repeated John. "'What do you mean by that, Pinch? You have not forgotten my Christian name, I suppose?' "'No, John, no, I have not forgotten,' said Thomas Pinch. "'Good gracious me, how kind you are!' "'I never saw such a fellow in all my life,' cried John. "'What do you mean by saying that over and over again? "'What did you expect me to be, I wonder? "'Here, sit down, Tom, and be a reasonable creature. "'How are you, my boy? I'm delighted to see you.' "'And I am delighted to see you,' said Tom. "'It's mutual, of course,' returned John. "'It always was, I hope. "'If I had known you had been coming, Tom, I would have something for breakfast.' I would rather have such a surprise than the best breakfast in the world myself, but yours is another case, and I have no doubt you are as hungry as a hunter. You must make out as well as you can, Tom, and we'll recompense ourselves at dinner-time. You take sugar, I know. I recollect the sugar at Pecksniff's. Ha! <laughs> ha! How is Pecksniff? When did you come to town? Do begin at something or other, Tom. There are only scraps here, but they are not all bad. Boar's head potted. Try it, Tom. Make a beginning, whatever you do. What an old blade you are! I am delighted to see you." While he delivered himself of these words in a state of great commotion, John was constantly running backwards and forwards, to and from the closet, bringing out all sorts of things in pots, scooping extraordinary quantities of tea out of the caddy, dropping French rolls into his boots, pouring hot water over the butter, and making a variety of similar mistakes without disconcerting himself in the least. There, said John, sitting down for the fiftieth time, and instantly starting up again, to make some other addition to the breakfast. Now we're as well off as we're likely to be till dinner, and now let us have the news, Tom. Imprimis, how is Pecksniff? I don't know how he is, was Tom's grave answer. John Westlock put the teapot down, and looked at him in astonishment. I don't know how he is, said Thomas Pinch, and saving that I wish him no ill, I don't care. I have left him, John. I have left him for ever voluntarily why no for he dismissed me but i had first found out that i was mistaken in him and could not have remained with him under any circumstances i grieve to say that you were right in your estimate of his character it may be a ridiculous weakness john but it has been very painful and bitter to me to find this out i do assure you tom had no need to direct that appealing look towards his friend in mild and gentle depreciation of his answering with a laugh John Westlock would as soon have thought of striking him down upon the floor. It was all a dream of mine, said Tom, and it's over. I'll tell you how it happened at some other time. Bear with my folly, John. I do not, just now, like to think or speak about it. I swear to you, Tom, returned his friend, with great earnestness of manner, after remaining silent for a few moments, that when I see, as I do now, how deeply you feel this, I don't know whether to be glad or sorry that you have made the discovery at last. I reproached myself with the thought that I ever jested on the subject. I ought to have known better. My dear friend, said Tom, extending his hand, it is very generous and gallant in you to receive me and my disclosure in this spirit. It makes me blush to think that I should have felt a moment's uneasiness as I came along. You can't think what a weight is lifted off my mind, said Tom, taking up his knife and fork again, and looking very cheerful. I shall punish the boar's head dreadfully. The host, thus reminded of his duties, instantly betook himself to piling up all kinds of irreconcilable and contradictory viands in Tom's plate, and a very capital breakfast Tom made, and very much the better for it Tom felt. "'That's all right,' said John, after contemplating his visitor's proceedings with infinite satisfaction. "'Now about our plans. You're going to stay with me, of course. Where's your box?' "'It's at the inn,' said Tom. "'I didn't intend—' never mind what you didn't intend john westlock interposed what you did intend is more to the purpose you intended in coming here to ask my advice did you not tom certainly and to take it when i gave it to you yes rejoined tom smiling if it were good advice 
which being yours i have no doubt it will be very well then don't be an obstinate old humbug in the outset tom or i shall shut up shop and dispense none of that invaluable commodity you are on a visit to me i wish i had an organ for you tom so do the gentleman downstairs and the gentleman overhead i have no doubt was tom's reply let me see in the first place you will wish to see your sister this morning pursued his friend and of course you will like to go there alone i'll walk part of the way with you and see about a little business of my own and meet you here again in the afternoon put that in your pocket tom it's the only key of the door if you come home first you'll want it really said tom quartering oneself upon a friend in this way why there are two keys interposed john westlock i can't open the door with them both at once can i what a ridiculous fellow you are tom nothing particular you'd like for dinner is there oh dear no said tom very well then you may as well leave it to me have a glass of cherry brandy tom not a drop what remarkable chambers these are said pinch there's everything in em bless your soul tom nothing but a few little bachelor contrivances the sort of impromptu arrangements that might have suggested themselves to philip quarrel or robinson crusoe that's all what do you say shall we walk by all means cried tom as soon as you like accordingly john westock took the french rolls out of his boots and put his boots on and dressed himself giving tom the paper to read in the meanwhile when he returned equipped for walking he found tom in a brown study with the paper in his hand dreaming tom no said mr pinch no i have been looking over the advertising sheet thinking there might be something in it which would be likely to suit me but as i often think the strange thing seems to be that nobody is suited here are all kinds of employers wanting all sorts of servants and all sorts of servants wanting all kinds of employers and they never seem to come together here is a gentleman in a public office in a position of temporary difficulty who wants to borrow five hundred pounds and in the very next advertisement here is another gentleman who has got exactly that sum to lend but he'll never lend it to him john you'll find here is a lady possessing a moderate independence who wants to board and lodge with a quiet cheerful family and here is a family describing themselves in those very words a quiet cheerful family who want exactly such a lady to come and live with them but she'll never go john neither do any of these single gentlemen who want an airy bedroom with the occasional use of a parlour ever appear to come to terms with these other people who live in a rural situation remarkable for its bracing atmosphere within five minutes walk of the royal exchange even those letters of the alphabet who are always running away from their friends and being entreated at the tops of columns to come back never do come back if we may judge from the number of times they are asked to do it and don't it really seems said tom relinquishing the paper with a thoughtful sigh as if people had the same gratification in printing their complaints as in making them known by word of mouth as if they found it a comfort and a consolation to proclaim i want such and such a thing and i can't get it and i don't expect i ever shall john westlock laughed at the idea and they went out together so many years had passed since tom was last in london and he had known so little of it then that his interest in all he saw was very great he was particularly anxious among other notorious localities to have those streets pointed out to him which were appropriated to the slaughter of countrymen and was quite disappointed to find after half an hour's walking that he hadn't had his pocket picked but on john westlock's inventing a pickpocket for his gratification and pointing out a highly respectable stranger as one of that fraternity he was much delighted his friend accompanied him to within a short distance of camberwell and having put him beyond the possibility of mistaking the wealthy brass and copper founders left him to make his visit arriving before the great bell handle tom gave it a gentle pull the porter appeared pray does miss pinch live here said tom miss pinch is governess here replied the porter at the same time he looked at tom from head to foot as if he would have said you are a nice man you are where did you come from it's the same young lady said tom it's quite all right is she at home i don't know i'm sure rejoined the porter do you think you could have the goodness to ascertain said tom he had quite a delicacy in offering the suggestion for the possibility of such a step did not appear to present itself to the porter's mind at all the fact was that the porter in answering the gate bell had according to usage rung the house bell for it is as well to do these things in the baronial style while you are about it and that there the functions of his office had ceased being hired to open and shut the gate and not to explain himself to strangers 
he left this little incident to be developed by the footman with the tags who at this juncture called out from the doorsteps hullo there what are you up to this way young man oh said tom hurrying towards him i didn't observe that there was anybody else pray is miss pinch at home she's in replied the footman as much as to say to tom but if you think she has anything to do with the proprietorship of this place you had better abandon that idea i wish to see her if you please said tom the footman being a lively young man happened to have his attention caught at that moment by the flight of a pigeon in which he took so warm an interest that his gaze was riveted on the bird until it was quite out of sight he then invited tom to come in and showed him into a parlour any name said the young man pausing languidly at the door it was a good thought because without providing the stranger in case he should happen to be of a warm temper with a sufficient excuse for knocking him down it implied this young man's estimate of his quality and relieved his breast of the oppressive burden of rating him in secret as a nameless and obscure individual say her brother if you please said tom mother drawled the footman brother repeated tom slightly raising his voice and if you will say in the first instance a gentleman then say her brother i should be obliged to you as she does not expect me or know i am in london and i do not wish to startle her the young man's interest in tom's observations had ceased long before this time but he kindly waited until now when shutting the door he withdrew dear me said tom this is very disrespectful and uncivil behaviour i hope these are new servants here and that ruth is very differently treated his cogitations were interrupted by the sound of voices in the adjoining room they seemed to be engaged in high dispute or in indignant reprimand of some offender and gathering strength occasionally broke out into a perfect whirlwind it was in one of these gusts as it appeared to tom that the footman announced him for an abrupt and unnatural calm took place and then a dead silence he was standing before the window wondering what domestic quarrel might have caused these sounds and hoping ruth had nothing to do with it when the door opened and his sister ran into his arms why bless my soul said tom looking at her with great pride when they had tenderly embraced each other how altered you are ruth i should scarcely have known you my love if i had seen you anywhere else i declare you are so improved said tom with inexpressible delight you are so womanly you are so positively you know you are so handsome if you think so tom oh but everybody must think so you know it said tom gently smoothing down her hair it's a matter of fact not opinion but what's the matter said tom looking at her more intently how flushed you are and have you been crying no i have not tom nonsense said her brother stoutly that's a story don't tell me i know better what is it dear i'm not with mr pecksniff now i'm going to try and settle myself in london and if you are not happy here as i very much fear you are not for i begin to think you have been deceiving me with the kindest and most affectionate intention you shall not remain here oh tom's blood was rising mind that perhaps the boar's head had something to do with it but certainly the footman had so had the sight of his pretty sister a great deal to do with it tom could bear a good deal himself but he was proud of her and pride is a sensitive thing he began to think there are more pecksniffs than one perhaps and by all the pins and needles that run up and down in angry veins tom was in a most unusual tingle all at once we will talk about it tom said ruth giving him another kiss to pacify him i'm afraid i cannot stay here cannot replied tom why then you shall not my love heyday you are not an object of charity upon my word tom was stopped in these exclamations by the footman who brought a message from his master importing that he wished to speak with him before he went and with miss pinch also show the way said tom i'll wait upon him at once accordingly they entered the adjoining room from which the noise of the altercation had proceeded and there they found a middle-aged gentleman with a pompous voice and manner and a middle-aged lady with what may be termed an excisable face or one in which starch and vinegar were decidedly employed there was likewise present the eldest pupil of miss pinch to whom mrs todgers on a previous occasion had called a syrup and who was now weeping and sobbing spitefully my brother sir said ruth pinch timidly presenting tom oh cried the gentleman surveying tom attentively you really are miss pinch's brother i presume you will excuse my asking i don't observe any resemblance miss pinch has a brother i know observed the lady 
"'Miss Pinch is always talking about her brother when she ought to be engaged upon my education,' sobbed the pupil. "'Sophia, hold your tongue,' observed the gentleman. "'Sit down, if you please,' addressing Tom. Tom sat down, looking from one face to another, in mute surprise. "'Remain here, if you please, Miss Pinch,' pursued the gentleman, looking slightly over his shoulder. Tom interrupted him here by rising to place a chair for his sister, having done which he sat down again. "'I am glad you chanced to have called to see your sister to-day, sir,' resumed the brass and copper founder. "'For although I do not approve, as a principle, of any young person engaged in my family in the capacity of governess, receiving visitors, it happens in this case to be well timed. I am sorry to inform you that we are not at all satisfied with your sister. We are very much dissatisfied with her, observed the lady. I would never say another lesson to Miss Pinch if I was to be beat to death for it, sobbed the pupil. Sophia, cried her father, hold your tongue. Will you allow me to inquire what your ground of dissatisfaction is? asked Tom. Yes, said the gentleman, I will. I don't recognise it as a right, but I will. Your sister has not the slightest innate power of commanding respect. It has been a constant source of difference between us. Although she has been in this family for some time, and although the young lady who is now present has almost, as it were, grown up under her tuition, that lady has no respect for her. Miss Pinch has been perfectly unable to command my daughter's respect or to win my daughter's confidence. Now, said the gentleman, allowing the palm of his hand to fall gravely down upon the table, I maintain that there is something radically wrong in that. You as her brother may be disposed to deny it. I beg your pardon, sir, said Tom. I am not at all disposed to deny it. I am sure that there is something radically wrong, radically monstrous in that. Good heavens, cried the gentleman, looking round the room with dignity. What do I find to be the case? what results obtrude themselves upon me as flowing from this weakness of character on the part of miss pinch what are my feelings as a father when after my desire repeatedly expressed to miss pinch as i think she will not venture to deny that my daughter should be choice in her expressions genteel in her deportment as becomes her station in life and politely distant to her inferiors in society i find her only this very morning addressing Miss Pinch herself as a beggar. A beggarly thing, observed the lady in correction. Which is worse, a beggarly thing, a low, coarse, despicable expression. Most despicable, cried Tom. I am glad to find that there is just appreciation of it here. So just, sir, said the gentleman, lowering his voice to be the more impressive. So just, that but for my knowing Miss Pinch to be an unprotected young person, an orphan, and without friends, I would, as I assured Miss Pinch upon my veracity and personal character a few minutes ago, I would have severed the connection between us at that moment and from that time. Bless my soul, sir, cried Tom, rising for his seat, for he was now unable to contain himself any longer. Don't allow such considerations as those to influence you, pray. They don't exist, sir. She is not unprotected. She is ready to depart this instant. Ruth, my dear, get your bonnet on. "'Oh, a pretty family!' cried the lady. "'Oh, he's her brother, there's no doubt about that.' "'As little doubt, madam,' said Tom, "'as that the young lady yonder is the child of your teaching, "'and not my sister's Ruth. "'My dear, get your bonnet on.' "'When you say, young man,' interposed the brass and copper founder haughtily, "'with that impertinence which is natural to you, "'and which I therefore do not condescend to notice further, "'that the young lady, my eldest daughter, has been educated by any one but Miss Pinch. I needn't proceed. You comprehend me fully. I have no doubt you are used to it. Sir, cried Tom, after regarding him in silence for some little time, if you do not understand what I mean, I will tell you. If you do understand what I mean, I beg you not to repeat that mode of expressing yourself in answer to it. My meaning is that no man can expect his children to respect what he degrades. Ha, 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 laughed the gentleman. Cant, cant, the common cant. The common story, sir, said Tom. The story of a common mind. Your governess cannot win the confidence and respect of your children, forsooth. Let her begin by winning yours, and see what happens then. Miss Pinch is getting her bonnet on, I trust, my dear, said the gentleman. I trust she is, said Tom, forestalling the reply. I have no doubt she is. In the meantime, I address myself to you, sir. You made your statement to me, sir. 
you require to see me for that purpose i have a right to answer it i am not loud or turbulent said tom which was quite true though i can scarcely say as much for you in your manner of addressing yourself to me and i wish on my sister's behalf to state the simple truth you may state anything you like young man returned the gentleman affecting to yawn my dear miss pinch's money when you tell me resumed tom who was not the less indignant for keeping himself quiet that my sister has no innate power of commanding respect of your children i must tell you it is not so and that she has she is as well bred as well taught as well qualified by nature to command respect as any hirer of a governess you know when you place her at a disadvantage in reference to every servant in your house how can you suppose if you have the gift of common sense that she is not in a tenfold worse position in reference to your daughters pretty well upon my word exclaimed the gentleman this is pretty well it is very ill sir said tom it is a very bad and mean and wrong and cruel respect i believe young people are quick enough to observe and imitate and why or how should they respect whom no one else respects and everybody slights and very partial they must grow oh very partial to their studies when they see to what a pass proficiency in those same tasks has brought their governess respect put anything the most deserving of respect before your daughters in the light of which you place her and you will bring it down as low no matter what it is you speak with extreme impertinence young man observed the gentleman i speak without passion but with extreme indignation and contempt for such a course of treatment and for all who practise it said tom why how can you as an honest gentleman profess displeasure or surprise at your daughter telling my sister she is something beggarly and humble when you are for ever telling her the same thing yourself in fifty plain outspeaking ways though not in words and when your very porter and footman make the same delicate announcement to all comers as to your suspicion and distrust of her even of her word if she's not above their reach you have no right to employ her no right cried the brass and copper founder distinctly not tom answered if you imagine that the payment of an annual sum of money gives it to you you immensely exaggerate its power and value your money is the least part of your bargain in such a case you may be punctual in that to half a second on the clock and yet be bankrupt you have nothing more to say said tom much flushed and flustered now that it was over except to crave permission to stand in your garden until my sister is ready not waiting to obtain it tom walked out before he had well begun to cool his sister joined him she was crying and tom could not bear that any one about the house should see her doing that they will think you are sorry to go said tom you are not sorry to go no tom no i have been anxious to go for a very long time very well then don't cry said tom i am so sorry for you dear sobbed tom's sister but you ought to be glad on my account said tom i should be twice as happy with you for a companion hold up your head there now we go out as we ought not blustering you know but firm and confident in ourselves the idea of tom and his sister blustering under any circumstances was a splendid absurdity but tom was very far from feeling it to be so in his excitement and passed out at the gate with such severe determination written on his face that the porter hardly knew him again it was not until they had walked some short distance and tom found himself getting cooler and more collected that he was quite restored to himself by an inquiry from his sister who said in her pleasant little voice where are we going tom dear me said tom stopping i don't know don't you live anywhere dear asked tom's sister looking wistfully in his face no said tom not at present not exactly i only arrived this morning we must have some lodgings he didn't tell her that he had been going to stay with his friend john and could on no account think of billeting two inmates upon him of whom one was a young lady for he knew that would make her uncomfortable and would cause her to regard himself as being an inconvenience to him neither did he like to leave her anywhere while he called on john and told him of this change in his arrangements for he was delicate of seeming to encroach upon the generous and hospitable nature of his friend therefore he said again we must have some lodgings of course and said it as stoutly as if he had been a perfect directory and guide-book to all the lodgings in london where shall we go and look for em said tom what do you think tom's sister was not much wiser on such a topic than he was so she squeezed her little purse in his coat pocket and folding the little hand with which she did so on the other little hand with which she clasped his arm said nothing 
it ought to be a cheap neighbourhood said tom and not too far from london let me see should you think islington is a good place i should think it was an excellent place tom it used to be called merry islington once upon a time said tom perhaps it's merry now if so all the better eh if it's not too dear said tom's sister of course if it's not too dear assented tom well where is islington we can't do better than go there i should think let's go tom's sister would have gone anywhere with him so they walked off arm in arm as comfortably as possible finding presently that islington was not in that neighbourhood tom made inquiries respecting a public conveyance thither which they soon obtained as they rode along they were very full of conversation indeed tom relating what had happened to him and tom's sister relating what had happened to her and both finding a great deal more to say than time to say it for they had only just begun to talk in comparison with what they had to tell each other when they reached their journey's end now said tom we must first look out for some very unpretending streets and look out for bills in the windows so they walked off again quite as happily as if they had just stepped out of a snug little house of their own to look for lodgings on account of somebody else tom's simplicity was unabated heaven knows but now that he had somebody to rely upon him he was stimulated to rely a little bit more upon himself and was in his own opinion quite a desperate fellow after roaming up and down for hours looking at some scores of lodgings they began to find it rather fatiguing especially as they saw none which were at all adapted to their purpose at length however in a singular little old-fashioned house up a blind street they discovered two small bedrooms and a triangular parlour which promised to suit them well enough their desiring to take possession immediately was a suspicious circumstance but even this was surmounted by the payment of their first week's rent and a reference to john westlock esq furnival's inn high holborn ah it was a goodly sight when this important point was settled to behold tom and his sister trotting round to the bakers and the butchers and the grocers with a kind of dreadful delight in the unaccustomed cares of housekeeping taking secret counsel together as they gave their small orders and distracted by the least suggestion on the part of the shopkeeper when they got back to the triangular parlour and tom's sister bustling to and fro busy about a thousand pleasant nothings stopped every now and then to give old tom a kiss or a smile upon him tom rubbed his hands as if all islington were his it was late in the afternoon now though and high time for tom to keep his appointment so after agreeing with his sister that in consideration of not having dined they would venture on the extravagance of chops for supper at nine he walked out again to narrate these marvellous occurrences to john i am quite a family man all at once thought tom if i can only get something to do how comfortable ruth and i may be ah that if but it's of no use to despond i can but do that when i have tried everything and failed and even then it won't serve me much upon my word thought tom quickening his pace i don't know what john will think has become of me he'll begin to be afraid i have strayed into one of those streets where the countrymen are murdered and that i have been made meat pies of or some such horrible thing End of chapter thirty six